So let me just say, for, we have new people here, and we welcome you very much. But if you don't know what we are, I'll just tell you. I'm Susan McDaniel, director of the Prentice Institute for Global Population and Economy, and I have cat and hat titles. So I won't go through all those. It's because they're too many. It confuses me. But uh, so it's great you're all here, and I will introduce our speaker and uh, mention what our plan is for today in just a minute. But I'm required to make some announcements. The first one is that this is a co-sponsored event, and we're delighted about that. Uh, we co-sponsored an event with the um, Institute for Children and Youth um, recently, and now we're co-sponsoring with the uh, Center for Culture and Community. So let me make, first of all, thank them, and then um, make some announcements about what they're doing. Whoops, I promise I wouldn't stand in front of you. <laughs> Um, and then make some um, uh, comments, uh, some announcements about what we're doing. So the Center for Culture and Community, the director of which is Bill Ramp, my colleague in sociology, uh, is having something this Friday on the 9th of December. I'm sure you can find out all about this, but it's co-sponsored co with the Chinook uh, Food Connect at Alberta Health Services. And it's going to be a video conference on planting seeds together, partnering to promote food security. Uh, we've had a number of talks uh, on food security <coughs> and uh, issues related to agriculture and global population. Uh, one time we had one that was splendidly attended. A lot of agro-producers came, which was quite lovely. Uh, so they're doing that uh, this Friday, uh, which is good because there are no classes yet, so that's a good thing. On January 11th, uh, right after the holidays, uh, the uh, Center for Culture and Communities again partnering with Chinook Food Connect to host a talk um, on the implications of Lethbridge's commitment to uh, South Saskatchewan Regional Plan and uh, Environment, Executive Director of Environment Lethbridge will be there as well. So that's on January 11th. Mid-January, they're going to be partnering with SACPA on something, but they don't tell me what, so. <laughs> Watch SACPA for this great institution, the leader of which is here. Um, and uh, today's talk, Bill mentions, connects with the theme we're working on for a possible form in the spring. So he's asking, uh, incidentally, he had a competing commitment, so he may come later, but that's why he's not here with me today. Uh, so we're look, they're looking for partners and supporters for a forum on strengthening multicultural cohesion from the grassroots to the national level in Canada, something that I think we're all interested in. So they're doing that. So uh, Bill uh, says he's, he, he's glad we're partnering on this event, so I hope he can do more partnering. Partnering is good. Okay, let me just mention a couple of Prentice events uh, next term. I won't specifically go into details, but we have a quite interesting brown bag on uh, February 3rd with James Graham, who is in New Media and has his own company. He's one of these spin-off from the university people. Uh, and he's going to be talking about how he does some, uh, some um, new media uh, stuff. He's going to be demonstrating some of that. Uh, and, uh, and that will connect with our mandate. He's a research affiliate of the Prentice Institute. And on February 24th, the same month, we'll have others, but we haven't got them announced yet. Brenda Loom, who is uh, another research affiliate, um, uh, will be talking on alternative health. She's done some research on uh, alternative health. She has a chair in alternative health at the, at the university, but also a research affiliate of the Prentice. So we're having quite a number of things in the spring, which should be uh, good, so come around. Okay, let me just say before I introduce our speaker, and I'm not gonna take them all the time, I promise, <laughs> that we got a little bit um, too eager in the poster uh, the, this is indeed the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which is important for two reasons. One is it brought the Americans into the war, which was already ongoing. It didn't start with Pearl Harbor. It had already been going for something like two years. Canadians were in the war. Brits were in the war. Quite a few other countries were in the war. But the bombing of Pearl Harbor brought the Americans in. So that's not when it started. The second reason why it's so important, and this is something that I think we'll dwell on today, is because it started um, a movement against Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians who were um, interned 
uh, not in Alberta, uh, but in British Columbia and in other places in the United States. And uh, so for two reasons. One is uh, we're, cel we're not celebrating, but we're noting the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which was 75 years ago today. <coughs> uh, and then we're going to uh, be talking, hearing a lot about the internment of the Japanese Canadians. But what I'd like to do uh, in the discussion is talk about that very important issue, which um, George and I were talking about briefly. People don't talk about enough. It's almost like it's in the past, people don't want to talk about it, which is understandable. But my sense is, and I think a lot of people who weren't alive at the time, um, uh, like, like me, um, want to know about how, what lessons we can learn from that that apply to today. Come in, please. Um, and so that's important because there's an awful lot of rhetoric, language, and hopefully not actions that are um, sort of resonant of what happened then, uh, tar targeting different groups. So let me, with that said, let me introduce uh, George Takashima. Now, some of you know him well. Uh, I didn't, uh, but so it's my privilege to get to know him. When I read this short bio, I think he must have had two or maybe three different lives because he's done so much. Uh, it's, it's completely amazing. Uh, he has a, a BA and a B.Ed. and a Doctor of Divinity. Uh, he's been a retired educator, hospital chaplain, and pastor. Spent 34 years in public education in three provinces at all kinds of levels. Classroom teacher, elementary high school principal, assistant superintendent, superintendent of schools, language consultant in three provinces. See what I mean? That's, that's already a couple of lives, but that's not at the end of it. He also served as a field service officer for the Manitoba Department of Education and spent over 20 years as a pastor and Christian education worker and hospital chaplain in the three prairie provinces. George has been spending a lot of time, and this for which we are very grateful, telling his story of the Japanese Canadians and their wartime and post-war experiences in Canada. And to this end, he's conducted six five-day, come in please, there are lots of seats. He's conducted uh, six five-day ghost town bus tours uh, from 2010 to 2014 and into 16 into the West Kootenays where the internment camps were located. And in June uh, 2017, uh, from the 19th to the 23rd, I hope I have the dates right, he will be conducting a seventh tour in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So we're very delighted to have him here to share his experiences. I'm sure it'll be very interesting, and we can have a discussion uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, and please note that this, um, wherever it is, paper going round, is to put your name and, and, and thanks, Andrew, to put your name and email if you want to be connected for future events with Apprentice. So if you haven't gotten that and you want, do you want a pen? You look like you might need a pen. <coughs> there we go. My very expensive pen. <laughs> expensive pens wander off, so <laughs> no point in having them. Um, okay, so uh, that said, help yourself to coffee, and uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to speak with us. We welcome you. Um. I'd like to uh, thank the Apprentice Institute for inviting me to uh, be the speaker this morning or at noon. Um, I am one of the internees. I was a young internee, um, and there's very few of us left across the country. Um, and I was one who didn't really like to talk about it until I moved to Lethbridge in 1993. And two things caught my eye. Number one was I didn't know that there were Japanese Canadians living in southern Alberta as early as 1901, when the first group of people from Okinawa came and settled in southern Alberta. So that was one. Number two, I didn't realize that there were so many Japanese Mormons that, that caught my eye, and so uh, as I was uh, uh, working with the uh, South Alberta Japanese United Church, I decided 
I would do some more investigating. And one thing led to another. And within five years of my being in Lethbridge, I did quite a bit of study about the Japanese Canadians, not only in southern Alberta, but right across the country, and sort of reconnect with my roots and uh, to uh, uh, get a sense of where the JCs were. Because for 40 years, I had nothing to do with the Japanese people in Canada. In my line of work as an educator, I worked in areas where there were very few or no Japanese at all. So the story I have to tell today is my story. And if you talk to other uh, Japanese people and some internees or descendants of internees, they may have a, an entirely different take. So what I am doing is sharing with you my story as I understand it in Canada. It was in uh, 1877 that the first Japanese arrived in Canada and settled in New Westminster and later in uh, Victoria. And his name was Manzo Nagano. His grandson is uh, an Episcopalian clergy in the state of Washington. Nagano as I understand it, uh, had some connections with the Christian church in Japan. Now, to what extent, I don't know. But, but certainly he was not, um, uh, he, he, he was not uh, uh, a person who didn't understand what this Christian faith was. By the turn of the century, there were some 15,000 Japanese who had come to Canada. Goodly number of that 15,000 were men who came from farming communities. And they were the second or third or fourth sons within the family. Because in the Japanese culture, the number one son gets everything. <laughs> OK? Number one son inherits the farmland, and so for the number two sons and number three, they had nothing to look forward to. And they had heard that in America there were opportunities to make money. And so a lot of these guys came with the idea, hey, I'm going to work for about five years, they've heard about the gold mines, and they're going to make money, and they'll go back to Japan, and they'll live like a rich person. Well, that never materialized. Because when they came to Canada, first of all, they did not have uh, any handle on the English language. And they could only get jobs that were of a laboring type, whether it was in the forestry or in the farming. And a lot of them eventually got into the fishing. And so by, in the early 1900s then, you have uh, about 15,000 or so Japanese. Now a lot of these guys came on their own. They were single guys. And uh, because they uh, resigned to the fact that they're going to be living in Canada, they're not going to go back to Japan, they needed wives. And so without going into detail, we have the origins of picture brides, you know, where pictures are taken and the guy is dressed up uh, in neck, uh, neckties and shirt and suit or tuxedo, and these pictures are sent over to Japan, and then the family members try to find uh, a bride, a perfect woman for this guy. And then when these women come and meet their husbands-to-be, they realize they're not what the picture, <laughs> okay? And many of them ended up working in, uh, uh, in the bush. Many of them lived in a shack. 
And then most of the brides then resign themselves to the fact, okay, this is the way it's going to be, and I'm going to put up with it. Now, in the Japanese culture, to this day, there's two words you need to know. And one is called shikataganai. Shikataganai. Can't be helped. What's done is done. What's said is said. We move on. That's a philosophy that the Japanese in Japan had. The other is gambatte or gamber, to persevere. Those were the two things that the Japanese had. Those who came to Canada continued to have these two things as they faced a thing called racism in BC. Now BC was a very racist uh, province. Uh, there were Asian riots very early in the 20th century in Vancouver. Why is that? Well, because before the Japanese, the Chinese were here. A lot of them came and worked on the railways and once the rail, rail, rail lines were put through, a lot of them stayed. And eventually you got Chinatown in Vancouver, and in Victoria, and in other communities. But there appeared to be a lot of Asians in British Columbia. Now this is my take. There were a lot of Asians in British Columbia, and this frightened the white population. It frightened the white population partly because they did not know who these Asian Asians were. They could not get into the Asian community simply because most of the Asians did not speak English. They were quite comfortable living in their communities, speaking the mother tongue. All along the West Coast, Vancouver Island, these groups of Japanese settled and they engaged in fishing or in the lumbering industry or mining. Okay? The communities outside of Vancouver, the Japanese communities, were, if you will, family groups who came from a prefecture. Now in Japan, the prefecture is like the states in the United States or the provinces in Canada. My parents came from Kumamoto Prefecture. And so what happened was those people who came and settled, they settled as a prefectural group. And that was very comfortable because they could speak the same language. And they didn't need to speak English. Although some of the men managed to speak enough English that they would be understood by the wider community. But the women, for sure, did not learn to speak English. They were quite comfortable. So you have the immediate family group and you have the prefectural family groups settled all along the west coast. 90% of the Japanese population lived along the west coast. So in 1941, 75 years ago today, the Statistics Canada tells us that there are just over 23,300 Japanese people living in Canada at that time. 90% lived on the West Coast. The other 10, roughly 4,000, lived away from the West Coast. Some settled in the Okanagan Valley. And then, as I said, in 1901, um, the people from Okinawa came and settled in southern Alberta. And following them, there were people from Japan who came and settled in southern Alberta. Raymond, Cohurst, um, Hardyville. 
These were places where the Japanese people settled and took up farming. And there were, uh, they were, uh, uh, there was another larger group in Toronto. My parents and I lived in Toronto from 1938 to 1941. Very few Japanese people, other uh, in, in other places like Montreal, Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina, and these were merchants. Most of them, for example, in uh, Alberta and Edmonton and uh, Calgary, they were merchants who dealt with silk. For whatever reason, silk was a very uh, valuable commodity from Japan, which the Canadian populace uh, accepted. Okay. In 1914, some 200 Japanese, and some of them were, most of them were nationals, they were going to serve in the Canadian uh, military. But because of such racial hostility in uh, British Columbia, they had to come to Calgary in order to sign up. And most of them signed up with a, a, with a brigade in Calgary and served overseas. In 1931, these people, these soldiers, were granted the right to vote. Now, it wasn't until 1949 that Asians, the Asians, Chinese, Japanese, uh, people from India, were allowed to vote. Even if you were born in this country, you could not vote until 1949. Okay? So what happens? December the 7th, 1941, 75 years ago, Pearl Harbor. This is a day of infamy. And as our moderator said, that brought the United States into the war and you have the beginnings of a truly World War II. The government of the day, federal government, did not see any reason to take any further action upon the Japanese living in Canada because the RCMP and the military had done a thorough investigation and they reported to the government that you don't have to worry about the Japanese in Canada. They are loyal citizens. But the British Columbia government would not accept that. And they pressured the federal governments to do something about these Japs. Send them back to Japan. Get rid of them. Okay. In this midst, there are people who were born in this country. And they would say, what do you mean send me back to Japan? I'm born here, I'm Canadian. Okay, so there was this tension and finally Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of day said, all right, we will impose the War Measures Act. And they also labeled the JCs enemy aliens. And in the spring of 1942, the powers to be moved in and said to the JCs, you have 24 hours to get out of here. You just take with you what you can carry in two suitcases. The rest we will turn over for, uh, uh, to, to be taken care of by the British Columbia Security Commission whether they were farm properties, fishing boats, 
vehicles, houses, whatever the JCs owned, all of those things would be turned over to the British Columbia Security Commission to be looked after until the day that they could be back into the West Coast. So, some uh, um, eight, some 8,000 moved east of the Rockies. If they wanted to stay as families, they had to go east of the Rockies. Now there was a group, for example, in Lulu Island. Lulu Island is where the Vancouver uh, International Airport is located. And in Lulu Island, there was a fish cannery, and there was a group of Japanese people who worked in that cannery. And they asked that they be sent together east of the Rockies. And they ended up in Barnwell, just west of uh, Tabor. And then there were other groups who moved, and they ended up in Manitoba. So a goodly number of those who chose to move east of the Rockies would end up in Alberta, in the uh, farms, or in Manitoba, again on the farms, or some of them moved to Montreal and Toronto. The other 12,000 were placed in internment camps. Many of these places were uh, uh, abandoned mining communities. A handful of people lived in these mining communities. New Denver, Sandon, Caslow. These were areas where at the turn of the century, back in the 1900s, mining was flourishing, but by 1910, the mines closed their doors because they ran out of minerals and people moved away but there were still a few people who stayed and so the powers of be decided okay these are places we could send these Japanese <coughs> to and establish an internment camp and so all the buildings were now, uh, the empty buildings were refurbished, fixed up, and people were moved in there. There were other places where they had to build shacks out of nothing. In the Slocan Valley, Lemon Creek, Popoff, Bay Farm, they were just farmlands or, or just land, pasture lands. And in these pasture lands, community, uh, shacks were built and the community sprung up. Lemon Creek, some 1,200 people. Bay Farm, about 1,000. Uh, Popoff, about 1,000. And into these shacks, the people were uh, forced to go and live. Take this. A shack was maybe half the size of a classroom. Now, a classroom is roughly 750 square feet. So, uh, what you're looking at is shacks that have been built around 400 square feet or even smaller. And in these shacks, two families would be put into these shacks. There would be one room here, one room here, and a center room, which is kind of like the kitchen. Okay? No heat. No running water, they had pot belly stoves, they had to burn these, uh, they, they, they used the firewood to get the heat into the building. Otherwise, they would freeze to death. Now in New Denver, and I can only speak of New Denver, during the first winter, there were still many people living in tents. Many people living in tents throughout that first winter. 
Most of the people had been moved into these internment camps uh, in the summer, in the late summer, early autumn of 1942. And so people did not have the opportunity to put in a garden. You can imagine the first year, the chaos. People didn't know what they had done. People didn't know why they were being evacuated to these places. The old, you know, the, the, the people, the Issei's, they're the ones who came from Japan. This was just a mystifying thing for them. Once they got settled, the government did not make any provisions for running off these communities. And so the people had to take it upon themselves to get organized. And this is where the dynamics, all kinds of dynamics, come into play. You remember I said that people before the war lived in family groups or in prefectural groups. All that was destroyed and in these internment camps you will find that families were living with other families who they did not know. It didn't matter whether you were rich or poor or middle class, whether you were a farmer or a city person, whether you were a uh, uh, entrepreneur, didn't matter. There was Japantown in Vancouver, which was sort of the center of Japanese activities prior to the war. All of these people were lumped together. So that was, that was another turmoil in the lives of the JCs. As the war progressed, a lot of the Canadian-born said, we're going to sign up and serve in the Canadian forces. A lot of the Canadian-born Japanese wanted to ensure the government that they were loyal Canadians. That was important. Okay, so, what happens? By, the, by 1943, there is a pro-Japanese group, mostly the Issei's, the people who came from Japan. They're the pro-Japanese group. And some of the older Nisei's, Canadian-born Nisei's, were pro-Japanese. Simply because of the way that they had been treated by the Canadian government. And so in the communities, and I, I lived in New Denver, and even though I was young, I was still old enough to know the dynamics of what was happening in that community. There was a tremendous amount of tension between the pro-Japanese and the pro-Canadians, and there was conflict. And then the families who said to their sons, okay, if you join the Canadian forces, you get the hell out of our lives. And that happened. Interesting, too, is the fact that these Canadians had to go to Calgary to sign up. Okay? And then some families who said, okay, if my son wants to join the Canadian Army, Navy, whatever, Shikata ganai. It cannot be helped, but we'll honor your decision. And that caused friction between this family and other friends who would say, Why are you letting your son join the enemy? The parents said, That's their decision. He's over 18 or 20 or 21. 
okay? Shikata ga nai. It cannot be helped. And of course, that created another friction at that level. You are my friend, but you're no longer my friend. You're my enemy now. Okay, so that kind of tension existed during the, um, during the internment years. Following, and even before, even before the war ended, there was a group of people in every internment camp who said, you know, when the time comes when we leave this place, there is no way we're going to form another Japantown. We're not going to have a little Tokyo. Because they felt that it was because of the little Tokyo and Japantown that there was such hostility from the white community towards the Japanese. We're going to scatter across the country. We're going to, and this is very important, they said to us, and my dad was one of them too, you're going to integrate, you're going to assimilate, you're going to forget about your Japanese-ness, forget about Japanese culture, Forget everything that has to do with Japanese. You're going to go into the mainstream. Of course, as I said, we lived in Toronto before the war years, so I knew a bit of that. And my dad, of course, uh, would not be as forceful as others because he knew that we were able to integrate and assimilate. The other thing that happened even before the war ended was that the federal government wanted to send everybody back to Japan at the request of the BC government. But they later backed off on that and they had what was called a repatriation, meaning that those who want to go back to Japan, you sign up. So there were some 4,000 people who did sign up and who did go back to Japan. And of course, the young children had no choice but to go with them, whereas the older, the older teens and the young people stayed and said, we're not going to Japan. That's not my country. We don't speak Japanese. We don't know Japanese. Culture. We're staying in Canada. This is our land. And so what happened was that uh, it split the family. The repatriation uh, uh, caused another kind of family dynamics. And, and many took off. Now, you know, Japanese culture, uh, even today, you obey your parents. In Japan, you obey your parents. And that existed in Canada before the war years. You obey your parents. By 1945, the hell with the parents. We're going to do what we think we have to do. That kind of mentality existed among the Canadian-born Japanese. And so when the war ended, the Japanese had to leave and go east, those who were not repatriated. Now the 4,000 who had lived away from the west coast, like in southern Alberta, or in the Okanagan Valley, or in other parts of Canada, they were not affected in terms of uh, losing property or any of those kinds of things that the Japanese on the west coast had experienced. For example, and I, I use this because many of you know this person, um, Mr. Oshiro was a CPR foreman working out of Kenora. And there were a lot of Japanese living in Kenora working for CPR, and then later all of them took off hither and yon. But Mr. Oshiro remained 
in uh, Kenora, Ontario, as foreman. His son, he had four or five sons and daughters. The oldest was Jim Oshiro. And he graduated from grade 13 in 1939, and he signed up to serve in the Canadian Forces. No difficulty. He just had to go to the Kenora Recruiting Station and sign up. And after the war, he was, uh, took advantage of the veterans' uh, benefits, and he went and studied at the university and became a medical doctor. And he settled in Coaldale, and that's where he had his practice to the uh, end of his days. He died about 10 years ago, I believe. Okay? So these guys were not affected. These guys were not affected in going to university or taking other post-secondary education. For some unknown reason, the women who wanted to go into nursing were affected. They could not go into a nursing school anywhere in BC or the rest of Canada, except one place. And that was in Lamont, Alberta, which is located east of Edmonton. And there were uh, some 16 uh, young Japanese Canadian uh, girls who were able to take nursing between 1934 and the late 40s, 50s, early 50s. So what happened after the war? Well, my family, we ended up in London, Ontario. Most of us assimilated, integrated into the mainstream community quite easily. Yeah, the first year or so, there were a few hostile feelings, but as the people got to know who you were, those feelings subsided. When there's only a few of you, it's vastly different than if there were many of you in one community. So a lot of us had Caucasian friends. We integrated into the school system so well that we completely forget about, forgot about our Japanese-ness. Yeah, there were times when you kind of became conscious. I know that some of the people said, you know, I wish I were white. And I was one of them too, in grade eight or nine, grade 10, I wish I was white. And I remember Wilbur Rice, who was a, a phys ed teacher at London Central Collegiate, took me in one day. He said, George, there's something bothering you, and we need to talk. I said, there's nothing bothering me. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> and he was very perceptive. And so to make a long story short, I said, I wish I was white. And he said, George, you can't do anything about your, uh, how you look. You're going to be a visible minority for the rest of your life. What are you going to do about it? To make a long story short, I learned that if people antagonized me or if people were critical of me, I would say, hey, that's your problem. I'm me. And if you don't like it, you have to deal with it. And that's been my philosophy right up to this day. And those of you who look at my Facebook, you know uh, I'm 95% crazy. <laughs> uh, some of you saw that. <laughs> and uh, I know Tad said, hey, I, that's why I like you, he said, <laughs> on Facebook. But yeah, you, you have to be your own person. And a lot of us turned out that way. Not only that, another dynamic of all the Asian groups in Canada, the Japanese Canadians have the highest intermarriage rate. 
anywhere in the country. Almost 90% are intermarried. So that it won't be too long, not that many years down the road, before there will be no pure Japanese, that is from the pre-war years. I mean, we have new immigrants coming in, but I'm not including them. Those who were from pre-war years, we would not have 100% pure Japanese because they have been integrated, assimilated, and they have intermarried. I intermarried 52 years. <laughs> well, 53. You know, um, and you know, there were when, when the intermarriages took place in those early years, 1950s, even 40s, there was this if you marry a Jap, your marriage isn't going to last. You're going to have all kinds of problems. Your kids will have all kinds of problems. I'm still waiting for those problems. <laughs> um, so those were the dynamics. Those were the, the, uh, the things that, that uh, the Japanese people faced and were able to overcome. When the war ended, one of the things that the parents also said was, and they took on the attitude of the Jews. You know, the Jewish people said to their children, you take a profession where you are your own boss. You don't have to work for anybody else. Well, the Japanese didn't go quite that far, but yes, they said, get into professions where uh, you're your own boss. So in the early years, in, 19, uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, many of the students who took post-secondary education at the university level became lawyers, doctors, dentists, accountants, architects, where they could be their own boss. Raymond Moriyama, one of the top architects, His parents said to Raymond, you take any profession where you are your own boss. And that's what Raymond did. He became an architect. There were, uh, and then as time went on in the 50s, of course, they started to branch out, got into engineering. They got into uh, um, various kinds of science programs. Now these are internment peoples, people who are saying this. Those who lived uh, in other parts of the country way before the war years, they had an entirely different kind of mentality. For, for example, uh, one of the guys who came out of southern Alberta, Bob Hiranaka, an agriculturalist working with agriculture. His parents never said you had to choose a, a, a profession where you're your own boss. That was never said. And, and there's a whole bunch of others in similar situations where they chose professions that they wanted to. But the internment kids were a bit different because their parents said, we will Pay your education. And that, that, by the way, is another thing. Um, moms and dads work their butts off to make enough money to send their sons and daughters to university. And so the parents, or the kids in return, chose the kind of profession that, that the uh, parents had uh, said. But I was rebellious. Uh, my dad wanted me to be a doctor, and I said, I don't want to be a doctor. Because he wanted to be a doctor, but he didn't become a doctor. His younger brother did. But he wanted to be a doctor, so he was going to make sure I became a doctor. And I said, no. 
I said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so I did one year of a five-year accountancy program after grade 13, and I decided this isn't my cup of tea. And then my girlfriend of the day uh, said, uh, I'm going to teacher's college. Why don't you come with me to teacher's college? So I thought that was a good deal because I didn't have to pay tuition. <laughs> In the 1950s, there was such a shortage of teachers that, uh, that, you know. But I also found this interesting that not many JCs went into the teaching profession. Very few at that time. Today, it's a different story, okay? Going back to the internment years, when we were placed into these camps, the government said there's no darn way that we're going to provide education. Absolutely none. Well, then there are groups such as churches, um, the old CCF party, which was a forerunner to uh, NDP. They said, hey, you can't do that. You have to provide education. And so the government said, okay, we'll pri provide education Grades one to eight. No teachers. They'll provide books. They'll pro provide whatever desks we can find. No teachers. Well, we had one, two, two Japanese uh, Canadians who were female, who were teachers uh, prior to uh, World War II. And so they were given the responsibility of choosing from university uh, students or uh, uh, high school grads and trained them to be classroom teachers. They ran a summer school in New Denver for six weeks and then they dispersed to the other internment camps and uh, they taught. But behind all this, the United Church, the Anglican Church, and the Roman Catholic Church, those three denominations provided the, the basis for establishing education in the internment camps. In New Denver, for example, uh, we had grades one to eight. The government said, no high school whatsoever. And this is where the churches stepped in. And provided high school education for high school students. And every summer, these elementary teachers would come to New Denver to be trained, to be given new knowledge and teaching skills, and then go back into the classroom. Now, you'll get different, different uh, take on this uh, when you talk to any internees uh, left. My uh, take on it is that we did not suffer. I was in London, Ontario in May of, uh, May of uh, 1947. I enrolled in grade seven. In June, the principal called my dad into the office and I thought, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> But I discovered that um, the principal had given me all kinds of tests. And he said to my dad, uh, we're going to put George into grade nine. Wow. And my dad said, no, <laughs> absolutely no. Because my grade seven was such helter skelter. I went into four different schools and I missed a month here, a month there. And, uh, but that sort of indicated that the education that we received in the war years by these untrained teachers were okay. We got the basics, the language, the math. Those two were very important. Social studies, science, all the other stuff, that, that, that didn't make any difference. <laughs> but math and English did. And that's what uh, the, uh, the, the trained teachers taught the, uh, the, the, the student teachers. Be good on math, be good on English. I guess I spoke too long. 
<laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm a retired pastor, but when I, uh, I do the sermons, I have to write. Because I found out that when I talk without notes, my sermons average about 45 minutes. So, anyways, um, I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, okay. you do what? Well, thank you very much. I <laughs>